Thanks for joining us. This year's virtual symposium features a conversation between one of our P50 Center of Excellence scholars and an important voice in the field, Dr. Sherman James. I'm sure you will find his story and his insights worth hearing. Leading today's conversation is Sakara Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a school psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Georgia. And now, here's Sakara. Thank you, Dr. Brody, and welcome, everyone. As we have this conversation today, you are welcome to enter questions in the chat area of YouTube or to email your questions to symposium at uga.edu. I will be joined shortly by Dr. James to have a discussion about his work and its value for us today. But first, let's briefly introduce him. It's 1955 in the rural South Carolina town of Hartsville. Jim Crow laws enforce the segregation that is the norm across the South. One of three boys in the hardworking James family, 12-year-old Sherman lands his first job sweeping floors, washing dishes, and whatever else needed to be done at the one pharmacy for black residents of the city. But he got more than just a job out of the deal. The pharmacy was a frequent hangout for the three black health professionals in town, including a doctor and dentist. Along with the pharmacist, these three men met often over cups of coffee to talk politics, science, and world affairs. And for five years, Sherman eavesdropped, expanding his worldview and appreciation for knowledge. Between this and his own observations of health issues in his family and community, he thought he might pursue a career in the health field. But after graduating from college and a stint in the Air Force, he earned a doctorate in psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. It was while he was nearing completion of this degree that he got a call from the Department of Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where they were studying differences in health between blacks and whites, combining insights from biology and the social sciences. It piqued his interest in a way he hadn't imagined, and so his journey began. And here he is, Dr. Sherman James, joining us from his home in Little Rock, Arkansas. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. James. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I just wish I could be there in person or that we could all be together in person. Definitely. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about your work and sort of building off of the video that we just saw. It seems like you eventually took the job at UNC. Can you tell us more about what they were doing and why it caught your interest? Okay, well, sure. Well, there was a combination, <clears throat> a combination of things. Um, uh, one, uh, where they were doing it, uh, as well as what they were doing. So they were doing it in, uh, in North Carolina and therefore in the South. And I was, I was eager to return to the South. So that was, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the University of North Carolina was in the early days of desegregating its faculty. Um, I would have been, uh, I mean, I was the fourth black professor that was hired at the university. Wow. And, the, and the first black professor hired in the School of Public Health. Yeah. So, so that was interesting. And I, I wanted to be a part of the changes that were beginning to take place in the South following the 1960s mm -hmm. civil rights movement after having been uh, away from the South for a decade uh, following my graduation from college and my stint in the Air Force and then graduate school. So it was an opportunity to return home. That mm -hmm. was interesting. And then in terms of what they were doing, so they were focusing on uh, black-white racial differences in cardiovascular disease, and um, and they wanted to bring they wanted to bring um, uh, a strong social science perspective to bear uh, on understanding those those differences. Uh, the department had had a long tradition of interdisciplinary collaboration between biological and social scientists, and the two psychologists who were on the faculty. Um, for like a decade, uh, left in late 1972, I guess it was, to go to, to Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, so the department decided that it would 
try to find a another psychologist and why not a black psychologist uh, to to join the faculty and and bring um, bring that perspective to bear on on the work. And when I went there for my job interview, I it was sort of on a lark. I I wasn't sure this was something I wanted to do, but the more I I heard, the more intrigued uh, I I became, and. Um, and, and it spoke to me, you know, it spoke to me in a way that um, made me recall my, my early life interest, if you will, in, in health and, and, um, and focusing on, you know, on the social conditions uh, that affect the health of African Americans. And that was something, as the video um, indicated, uh, was an early interest of mine once I, I began to think about what kind of future I wanted to have. So it was an opportunity to return to some interests that I had developed uh, uh, during my adolescence. Mm -hmm. So it seems like through some of this work that you did it with UNC, you got to meet John Henry Martin. Um, and it seems like that meeting had a big effect on you. Can you tell us more about why his story resonated with you? Well, yes, uh, I, I met John Henry Martin in 1978, so now this was five years after I had joined the faculty um, in the Department of Epidemiology at, at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, during that, during those first five years, I mean, they were very challenging years. I had not, I had not been formally trained uh, in epidemiology. I had the first year or so to, you know, be, learn some concepts, sit in on some classes. Um, and I had a lot of support, you know, from the, from my senior uh, colleagues uh, in terms of mentoring. And so little by little, you know, I, I began to to learn how to think as an epidemiologist, mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, more in terms of population, population level phenomena uh, in contrast to individual level phenomena, which is what we had focused on in, in psychology. And, uh, and so when I met John Henry Martin, uh, that meeting um, was the result of um, a decision that the faculty made in 1978 to um, conduct a high blood pressure intervention study in the eastern part of the state. Uh, and we wanted to focus on, on um, in designing interventions that would improve the control of high blood pressure in black men. Mm -hmm. uh, since black men were not only at uh, the highest risk of developing high blood pressure early in adult life, uh, even more so than black women, mm -hmm. black women caught up with black men um, after the change of life. But we we're talking about a population, particularly in eastern North Carolina, where, uh, which is known as the, the stroke death belt, mm -hmm. uh, a, a section of the coastal plains region that, that runs through the Carolinas, uh, down through Georgia. Mm -hmm. And this is where you have the, the highest mortality from stroke uh, anywhere, anywhere in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was a particularly um, uh, major cause of death um, for, for blacks. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to implement a high blood pressure control project in the eastern part of the, of the state, in the coastal plains region of the state. And we wanted to focus on black men with high blood pressure. So I said, well, maybe, maybe I could interview some black men who have high blood pressure and get some ideas about how we, how we can do this because we didn't have a clue about how to actually tailor the, um, the intervention, you know, to black men. And so a, a physician, uh, colleague, co-investigator who also took care of patients, um, said, okay, I have some, you know, black male patients and I'll line you up, uh, with some. So five, Five black males with high blood pressure were identified, and um, appointments were made uh, for me. And I drove out to um, Alamance, Alamance County, uh, which is about 30 miles north of Chapel Hill, to conduct my first interview. And my first interview was with a man named John Martin. I did not know his middle name <laughs> at the time. Uh, and so I uh, drove, drove to his home out in, in rural Alamance County, and he was waiting for me, sitting in his backyard, and uh, invited me to uh, join him 
uh, sitting in a in a rocking in a I guess it was a rocking chair right next to him. It was in July. It was very hot, and I did not have um, any pre-prepared questions. It was an open-ended interview. I just asked him to tell me about his life, and he began to tell me about his life. Now he was retired. He was 71 or 72 years of age at the time, like a 71. Um, and it was a remarkable story of how he uh, overcame deep childhood poverty. Um, he was born into a sharecropper family, uh, an illiterate, his parents were illiterate. Um, I guess, you know, his grandparents had been sharecroppers. Uh, the sharecropping system, as perhaps many people in the, you know, who are tuning in today, uh, no, you know, it was a, a terribly exploited uh, labor system uh, whereby um, illiterate black farmers, um, you know, uh, were hired out, if you will, on a year by year basis mm -hmm. to um, grow crops on land owned by, owned by whites, more often than not very wealthy whites. And at the end of the um, at the end of the, the season, uh, the harvest season, the crops would be sold, and theoretically, the sharecropper was supposed to get half of the profits. Mm -hmm. More often than not, uh, the landowner found, found very clever ways you know, mm -hmm. to um, uh, make sure that the um, sharecropper did not uh, get his uh, fair share. Um, and, and, uh, and because most of the sharecroppers were illiterate, you know, they really couldn't couldn't do the math, couldn't really understand what the books are saying, and and they just had to accept whatever the land owner said was owed them in terms of repaying advances on fertilizer, on farm equipment, etc. And so it was a system whereby black folks were uh, who were caught up in the situation, you know, were kept perpetually in debt. And so John Henry Martin, as a as a young fellow, decided that that was not the kind of future he wanted to have for himself. Mm -hmm. You've seen what happened to his father. Mm -hmm. So uh, when he entered um, young adulthood and uh, soon thereafter got married, he and his wife decided that they were going to buy some buy some land and uh, free themselves from that um, system of peonage. Uh, so he was able to get a, um, um, a mortgage from a bank. Uh, and the bank was very generous. They, it gave him a it gave him 40 years to pay off 75 acres of land, but he did not want to be beholden to anyone. Uh, he just didn't trust, you know, um, mm -hmm. the system, if you will. So he he decided he was going to try to pay off that loan in one year, um, and he worked he worked night and day, you know, oftentimes seven days a week, certainly six days a week was routine, and he managed to pay it off in five years, which was really astounding. And, um, and then he said to me, you know, near the end of this uh, story, and he was, he was a wonderful storyteller, just really spellbinding. Um, he said, uh, and I think that's the reason why my health is as bad as it is. I think that's the reason why my legs are all, all out of whack. I pushed myself too hard in the fields. Now, I knew he had high blood pressure, and he had a cane on his resting on his lap when I arrived, and and then he told me that he had a very severe case of osteoarthritis, which forced him to retire from farming um, long before he was ready to do so. And then also in the course of his story, he told me that um, in his fifties, late fifties, I guess it was, uh, he had had a case of peptic ulcers disease that was so severe that 40% of his stomach had to be removed. So now we have three conditions, you know, that I didn't know it at the time, but we now, you know, can understand our, our, our consequence of, of chronic inflammation. And so um, I was, you know, really very intrigued by this, but then his, his wife, after about two hours of just, you know, going back and forth chatting with him, his wife came to the door and she said, John Henry, uh, it's time for lunch and bring your guest with you. And uh, I looked at him. I said, your name is John Henry. He said, yes, John Henry Martin. And a light bulb went on. I said, holy cow, John Henry Martin, like John Henry, the steel driving man who went up against a machine, mm 
mm-hmm. in an epic steel driving contest. And, um, and he beat the machine, but he dropped dead from exhaustion uh, mm-hmm. because of all of the, you know, the energy, the, the toll that it, that it took on his entire system. Now, obviously, John Henry Martin did not, did not die, but he did pay a price um, for his victory over the machine. In this case, the machine was the sharecropper system. Well, that planted the seed in my mind, you know, for the concept of John Henryism, uh, because it seemed to me that his story um, was a story of, of African Americans in the South. Um, so many of whom were born into circumstances like he was born into. My grandparents on both sides, both sides of my family were born into those circumstances. Um, they were sharecroppers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had forgotten about their stories where his, John Henry Martin's story reminded me of their story. And so many people in my own family had high blood pressure uh, and a good many of them had died from stroke. Not so much from heart disease, but from stroke. So as I reflected on his story, I thought, well, could this be part of the puzzle of why the epidemic epidemic of high blood pressure is so severe and has such deadly consequences in the African-American population? So, so his story spoke to me on, on, on many levels, on the personal level, You know, his story was a story of my family, it was a story of my people. And importantly, it, his story provided a bridge for me from the field of psychology Mm -hmm. to epidemiology, which is something I very much needed because I had not figured out how I was going to bring these two, these two disciplines together. Mm -hmm. And so because John Henryism then is a psychological construct with deep, you know, roots in sort of the social, economic, and cultural uh, circumstances of African Americans. So fundamentally, it's a psychological construct. So I was now on my territory, if you will. I was now on my own sort of intellectual territory, and I could build a bridge to epidemiology. And and so for me, it just brought so many important things together, and 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 really helped to get my career uh, moving along. What an amazing story John Henry has of just sort of moving from sharecropper to landowner. And then also how interesting it is that it's like your first interview, right? You're going out, this is the very first interview that that you're having and the impact of this interview, connecting your your training in psychology to this epidemiology um, and how all of that really formed into this theory that you would later call John Henryism. Can you talk a little bit about what John Henryism is exactly? Sure. So uh, John Henryism, uh, the construct, um, refers to uh, repeated high effort coping, a, a behavioral, a strong behavioral predisposition, as shown here on this slide, a strong behavioral predisposition to confront adversity with determined high effort coping. I, I hope that you can see the connection between this conceptual definition and the story uh, of mm-hmm. John Henry Martin, uh, which uh, very much informed the way that I, I began to think about uh, the construct and actually how I went about uh, tr- um, developing an operational measure of it. And in the case of African Americans, adversity, uh, the most, the most, um, the most prominent uh, form of, a, of adversity, uh, as indicated here in the, in the footnote, is intergenerational economic hardship caused by laws, regulations, social norms, and institutional practices that limit meaningful social and economic advancement. And once again, the story of John Henry Martin is, is illustrative uh, of this kind of, of adversity, as is the legend of John Henry the steel driving man, whereby you have John Henry the steel driving man was very likely a convict laborer uh, thrown into into jail on some petty crime, and then sentenced, you know, to uh, you know to work on railroads, part of railroad crew, and tunneling through mountains as a, as a condition uh, 
you know, of his of his uh, sentence. And then, of course, he, according to one version of the of the legend, uh, was pitted against this steam drill and uh, lost his life uh, 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 as a result of that epic contest. So what we have here, you know, so John Henry Martin was born in the early part of the 20th century, uh, right around a time when Jim Crow laws were, were being put in place and, and the system of, um, of Jim Crow and white supremacy was really being locked down. And you had at the same time the emergence of you know, various forms of cultural racism, uh, denigrating black humanity and uh, voter suppression and a variety of a variety of, of mechanisms sort of being um, put in place to disempower the black population, to control the black population and prevent the, the black population from being able to advance in social in social and economic terms. And so what John Henryism is, it's, it's resistance to those those systemic constraints. It's the resistance to that system that's designed to hold black people in place in a subordinated position. And once again, that's what the legend of John Henry properly read is all about. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's what the uh, story of John Henry Martin is all about the resistance you see to to being uh, subjugated, to being prevented, to you know the resistance to being held in place and not being permitted to move to move forward and to be able to live your life with dignity, um, uh, and and you know and have the the things in life that you need in order to to be successful and to be healthy. And I think that this is something that is really quite widespread uh, in Black America. Uh, I think this is a widespread phenomenon, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people who think that it isn't, <laughs> is very widespread. And I think that my own, my own research um, makes, that, makes that clear. So that's the conceptual definition of John Henryism. And if the slide, if you put the slide back up, I can just say a word about the hypothesis, which is a, um, a logical extension of the construct of John Henryism. So the John Henryism hypothesis um, states that repeated high effort coping with adversity accelerates physiological wear and tear and leads to earlier onset of cardiovascular disease, uh, one key manifestation of which uh, is high blood pressure. Um, now here, uh, this particular conceptualization of the hypothesis really builds on the, um, on the now well-established um, concept of allostatic load, you know, physiological wear and tear, uh, across multiple multiple systems, the immune system, the circulatory system, um, the metabolic system, and so on. Um, and these are shown here in the footnote are some of the uh, biological mechanisms, if you will, that connect this uh, behavioral predisposition that I call John Henryism you know, to in-organ uh, damage. So. Uh, the, bi the, the linked biobehavioral process that I refer to as John Henryism operates through these uh, bio biological mechanisms listed in the footnote to result in um, hypertensive heart disease, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, heart attacks, um, uh, stroke, uh, and um, and uh, in stage renal disease. These are some of the these are some of the some examples of end organ damage that are known to be particularly prevalent uh, in in the um, in the African American population. So you talk about um, you know John Henryism being widespread, and we know that a lot of these things are definitely present in African Americans as far as the outcomes that you're talking about. But are there any examples of John Henryism in folks or professionals that we may be familiar with? Well, I like to, I, I guess I would prefer to talk about the arenas mm -hmm. or the, the situations in which high John Hinduism uh, is likely to emerge, you know, where you like to see it uh, on display. And, um, and I think that uh, those situations can be uh, characterized uh, primarily in terms of a, a circumstance where social and economic um, 
stressors, chronic social and economic stressors, threaten to overwhelm uh, the individual's coping resources. So social, social and economic circumstances that threaten to overwhelm the individual's ability to cope. So John Henryism then is rising, you know, a mobilization of psychological and um, behavioral, I'm going to say resources and any other social resources that one might have, but it's primarily a mobilization of one's psychological and cognitive and emotional resources to, to engage these social environmental stressors and to try to um, overcome them, to try to eliminate them. Mm -hmm. And, and so these, these stressors now can be, they can be material. Uh, they can, they can manifest as inadequate income, uh, job insecurity, uh, concerns about housing. Um, so these ma examples of material deprivation, uh, where one tries, one doubles down, one, one, one becomes dedicated to trying to acquire the resources mm. to meet these basic needs. So this is what John Henryism, this, these are the circumstances wherein John Henryism will emerge among poor and working class individuals mm. who are mobilizing everything that they have available to them in order to meet these material needs. Mm -hmm. Among middle class and upper middle class uh, uh, African Americans, it might take it might take on a somewhat different form. Mm -hmm. Social and psycho social, not so maybe not so much maybe economic stressors, but stressors that again pose a threat, mm -hmm. you know, to your ability to be who you want to be, you know, mm -hmm. to achieve the goals that you've set for yourself, and you see this uh, coming into you know into into visibility, if you will, when um, uh, a professional, uh, let's say an African-American who enjoys professional status, a college graduate or someone with an advanced degree, maybe even, you know, a black academic <laughs> who is, shall we say, uh, the first black academic, you know, in a predominantly white uh, institution, which was my case. Um, or a handful, you know, you know, you're, you're one of a handful of, of blacks in a in an otherwise otherwise all white, you know, sort of environment. And so the stressors are qualitatively different. You know, they're they're novel stressors. There's no there's no well developed paradigm, you know, for dealing with them. There's a lot of ambiguity, and that in and of itself is a is a stressor. So. So, so black Americans who find themselves in pioneering roles, path breakers, uh, in situations where they, <clears throat> where they, they have at least theoretically the opportunity to break a glass ceiling, uh, you're, you're likely to see John Henryism emerge, you know, in, in those circumstances as, as, as well. And so the combination of the ambiguity of the stressor, you know, the, the fact that it's not clear, it requires a great deal of vigilance and mobilization of cognitive resources to try to figure out, you know, understand the nature of the stressor. And then the social isolation, you know, you're kind of you're sort of on your own. You have to rely pretty much on your own resources in order to figure out how to navigate the situation. So I prefer to talk about the arenas within which you're likely to see what it looks like. What are the kinds of circumstances that can call forth this John Henderson response. And it might look, the, the, the stressors that call forth the response might look a little different, are likely to look different for poor and working class blacks. They're likely to be stressors having to do with material deprivation. Whereas for middle and upper middle class blacks, there's stressors that may have, uh, that are more likely to do with uh, social, a kind of a social deprivation or social isolation or ambiguity, uh, and then the cognitive and emotional resources that have to be mobilized in order to navigate those circumstances. Mm -hmm.
So everything that you're saying is definitely um, relatable as someone who is, you know, an African American academic. Um, but there are other people who might not understand this perspective. So what are some of the criticisms or misinterpretations that you've received of John Henryism? Uh, well, um, misinterpretations, I would say that early on, early on, the, there were maybe three. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind first is uh, the notion that that this is a um, black male specific mm -hmm. phenomenon that it applies exclusively to black males and even though um, the concept itself um, derived from this encounter that I had with with John Henry Martin and then um, a, a participant observation uh, study that I did um, in the early 1980s following my meeting with, with John Henry Martin. I actually went to live in, in the community where we were going to do that high blood pressure um, control project that I, I, I spoke about a, a while back. And I, I carried out the first um, study, field study of, of, of John Henryism, testing the John Henryism hypothesis. I had other objectives. Uh, associated with that, but I had developed a, uh, a first version, a developmental version of the John Henderson scale uh, while in the field. And, um, and so I did a participant observation study of black men. And um, and my first study was was published, uh, on John Henry, was published um, uh, dealing with findings from uh, the work that I did with uh, 130 132 uh, black males, which did provide some support for the John Henryism hypothesis, uh, which I should I should make clear, uh, states that it's the combination of of not having adequate uh, coping resources, you know, material and social resources, and scoring high on John Henryism. So not being particularly well educated, having you know a job that doesn't have much security, that doesn't pay very well. Uh, and the combination of being in that kind of economic situation and scoring higher on John Henryism mm. uh, is predicted to, you know, put you at high risk <clears throat> for having high blood pressure or for developing it. If we're talking about incidents, but the combination of, you know, I mean, of being better off uh, in terms of having a, you know, good paying job and being reasonable, be, being reasonably well educated, and scoring high on John Henryism, uh, that combination should be associated with um, a fairly low risk of of high blood pressure so it was so that the hypothesis is is designed to help us understand the heterogeneity of risk mm -hmm. for cardiovascular disease let's say high blood pressure uh, in the black population i began that work with black men um and uh, so when i pub when i published the first studies and i guess also because the construct of john Henryism you know, has a very strong connotation of, you know, black men, people automatically and understandably assume, oh, this is a black male phenomenon. But I never really thought that it was uh, exclusively a black male phenomenon. Well, I didn't know. That's an empirical question. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but yes, you know, my understanding of it was certainly informed by the things that I, I learned from thinking about black men, thinking about John Henry Martin, and the things that I learned from the from the sort of deep dive into the lives of these working class black men uh, whom I studied uh, you know, in my very first study. Um, had I, well, let me, let me just, I'll, I'll leave it there. So that's the first thing, but, I, but, it, but, but whether or not the John Henderson hypothesis applies to non-black men, whether it applies to whites, whether it applies to women, whether it applies to non-Americans, I mean, that's an empirical question. And it was one to which I was I was open, you know, to to investigating. So that's the first sort of misconception. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the second misconception, uh, and this is an important one, was that um, that John Henryism as a as a psychological attribute is inherently problematic. Uh, it is not inherently problematic, um, whether or not it's problematic, whether or not it is a risk factor, very much depends upon the social and economic resources that people have to work with. 
Mm -hmm. uh, a moment ago, I said the combination of not having, you know, adequate social and economic resources and scoring high is positive to put you at a higher risk. But the combination of having a fairly high level of, of education and adequate income and resources that you can mobilize so that when you sort of, you know, go into high gear with, uh, you know, John Henryism, right? You're going to be able to solve whatever problems you are facing uh, a lot easier than if you didn't have those resources. Mm -hmm. So being able to solve those challenges um, and scoring high on John Henryism, that combination means that you actually have a sense of mastery. You, you've achieved your goals and you, you know, it sort of, it adds to your sense of, of, of self-worth, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's restorative, it's, um, it's salutary, it, it does wonderful things psychologically as well as physiologically, in contrast to being in what I call the John Henryism situation, right? So, so, so John Henryism is not inherently prob uh, problematic, it's not an inherent risk factor. There are some circumstances under which it can actually be protective. But that is a circumstance that relatively few African Americans find themselves in, right? Mm -hmm. So most African Americans are in what I call the John Henryism situation. But since the 1965 civil rights, since the 1960s civil rights movement and the growth of the black middle class, you know, progressively we we have found you know a larger percentage of black Americans who are at least theoretically, you know, in a much better situation. And I think that that's that that also helps us to understand the social gradient, right? Mm -hmm. The inverse social gradient in cardiovascular disease risk among among African Americans. It helps to explain, you know, you know why people who are poor, or working class, are at greater risk for cardiovascular disease than those who are not. So you have the John Henryism, you know, phenomenon coming in, exacerbating you know risk you know for those who are disadvantaged economically, and adding some protection to those mm -hmm. who are better off. And that's one way of understanding that social gradient, where it comes from, why it, why it exists. That's really helpful. I, I think it's really nice to clarify, you know, those misconceptions around um, the theory. What has been learned about John Henryism since you first introduced it? Well, a lot, and there's a lot that we don't know. <laughs> um, I think that we've learned that it's not it's not um, specific to black males. There have been a number of mm -hmm. number of studies outside of the United States. The John Henryism scale, which we we didn't we didn't show, um, Dave, might, Dave might put it on the screen, um, but I'll just give a couple of examples. Oh, here we are. I've always felt that I can make of my life pretty much what I wanted to make of it. When things don't go the way I want them to, that just makes me work even harder. It's not always easy, but I usually find a way to do the things I really need to get done. And hard work has really helped me to get ahead in life. Now, there's you know there's nothing race, gender, or social class specific about about these questions. So these are these are questions that you know anybody really uh, can identify with and can and can respond to. Um, okay, you can take it. Now. You can remove it now. Uh, and so the John Henryism scale, the, the twelve questions. Those were just four illustrative items to give you. a a flavor of the kinds of questions that um, operationalize this construct of, you know, higher fit coping, you know, the idea that I'm not going to give up on my, on my goals, you know, I'm willing to work very hard to achieve my goals, um, you know, I'm going to be inventive in terms of how I go about, you know, finding, you know, finding solutions. So it's not this sort of cognitive rigidity idea that, you know, some people might, might automatically assume, you know, even when things don't go the way I want them to, uh, I find a way, you know, <laughs> to to make things work out. So there's some cognitive flexibility here. But obviously, people, you know, with limited resources are limited in terms of the kinds of things that they can uh, employ or deploy to solve their problems. But anyway, the John Henderson scale has been translated into 15 languages, and it has been used successfully in Europe. Uh, in uh, South America, in Latin America, in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, in India, <laughs> and in a variety of of, uh, of of racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it travels. It travels well. It travels well. It travels cross culturally. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one thing I think that's important, you know, to disabuse people of the idea that, oh, this is something that is specific to black males or is specific to black Americans. Uh, it is not. Uh, black men and black women uh, tend to score uh, almost identically uh, mm -hmm. on John Henryism. So it, it, it is tapping into something that is, you know, that is cultural, that is cultural uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the lives of, of African Americans. Um, so that's one thing that we that, that that we have learned. The second thing, and I'll just mention this this one other thing in the interest of time. The other thing that I think that we've learned, and it's really very important, and that is um, uh, my work on John Henryism uh, began. Um, it was primarily located in uh, in Eastern North Carolina, in rural and uh, semi-urban uh, black communities, right? Uh, and when the when tests, empirical tests of the John Henryism hypothesis <clears throat> was pursued by investigators in settings that were very different from mm -hmm. rural and semi-urban Eastern North Carolina, uh, we didn't always get, you know, support, empirical support uh, for the hypothesis, mm -hmm. and that casts, you know, that casts some significant doubt on the on the uh, validity of the hypothesis, you know, the, well, you know, if you can't see it in, in a variety of other places and a variety of different populations, then maybe it's something that is specific to black folks in rural, you know, rural America, you know, in the rural South. Well, um, we have learned that, and this is not my work, it's really work done by, by other investigators. Uh, when, when the hypothesis is tested in black populations, in urban areas, in a large uh, metropolitan uh, areas and in inner, with inner city African Americans where there's a very high level of, of concentrated poverty, where there's racial residential segregation, where there's a variety of um, neighborhood level stressors, uh, chronic stressors that impinge upon uh, black residents uh, because they live in certain, you know, disadvantaged, highly dense uh, communities that that lack the kinds of resources to to promote healthy living. And I should add, you know, over policing and noise, air pollution and unpredictability and crime and, you know, these really very, very uh, high stress uh, kinds of neighborhood conditions that you, you find, you know, in so many urban settings across the country. Well, if you limit the, your test of the John Henderson hypothesis to an individual's uh, education or income or occupation without taking into account the potential contribution that these neighborhood level stressors make on their mm -hmm. risk for high blood pressure, you might not actually see, you mm -hmm. know, an association, you might not actually observe empirical support for the hypothesis just using individual level variables. And, um, and so there's been, there was really one terrific study conducted in Chicago that was published in Psychosomatic Medicine in 2017 that did in fact take into account neighborhood level conditions mm -hmm. and individual level characteristics, right? Uh, and they interacted, I mean, they, did a, they tested the interaction between neighborhood level conditions and high John Henryism predicting uh, the prevalence of high, high blood pressure and the prevalence of obesity, controlling for individual level risk factors. And they found a, they found a very robust association um, between neighborhood level conditions, adverse neighborhood level conditions and John Henryism. Uh, and those conditions, when those conditions were reasonably advantageous, I mean, the neighborhood conditions were, you know, were pleasant, you know, uh, home ownership, uh, low levels of crime, um, high levels of education. When combined with high John Henryism, you found a relatively low level of high blood pressure. But in those neighborhood conditions where there's a lot of concentrated crime, unoccupied housing, um, um, uh, well, I guess those are some of the characteristics. Uh, lots of residential turnover. Under those circumstances, high John Henryism is associated with a much higher level of high blood pressure and higher, level, higher, higher risk for obesity. 
so I, so I think that that's you know that's an important um, that's an important insight that uh, the to, researchers need to be aware of the potential contribution of the larger environment, the larger physical and social environment when they test the hypothesis and and the stressors that are ambient in the physical and social environment can differ markedly between rural, rural areas, small towns, in contrast to large urban, urban areas. And that could account for some of the uh, mixed findings that we see uh, in the literature. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, you know, you know everyone needs to be able to account for, when looking at John Henryism, sort of, the intersection between John Henryism and sort of the individuals coping and the resources that they have available, but also sort of this broader context yes. around sort of level of risk. Correct. What is left to be learned about John Henryism? What are the next steps in this area? Uh, there, uh, there's a lot to be learned. Uh, you know, enough for you know four or five lifetimes uh, is for me. Uh, I'm. I'm at the end of my of my career, so um, you know the work the work to be done going forward um, uh, will have to be done by by the up and coming generation, and I and I hope and I hope that there is um, that there is a keen interest on the part of young young investigators and in, in in carrying the work forward. Well, I think that I think we need to know a whole lot more than we do about uh, the childhood origins. Uh, of John Henryism, my work has focused uh, primarily on on adults, on working age adults. Um, there have been a couple of studies uh, looking at um, uh, children, uh, mainly adolescents, and um, not a lot. Um, but there's every reason to believe that that uh, John Henryism has its roots in childhood socialization, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's important. So that you know if if the hypothesis is valid, if born, if, if being born into circumstances of material and social disadvantage and scoring high on John Henryism uh, results in a faster trajectory in adulthood toward cardiovascular disease, and if that process starts fairly early in life, then we need to know that. Mm -hmm. So that so that we can begin to mobilize, you know, resources, right? We can mobilize, as we're talking about the African-American community, we can mobilize uh, um, influential people uh, in, in the African-American community, you know, to be alert to this, to be alert to this phenomenon, that while we encourage, you know, black kids coming from impoverished uh, backgrounds to work hard and to you know, to do well in school and to, you know, be willing to make sacrifices uh, in order to, you know, get ahead, to be successful, uh, to be aware that that might be a downside, you know, there could be, there could be a downside uh, of that. Um, and so um, helping, uh, you know, leaders, uh, well-respected leaders in the, in the Black community understand what this phenomenon is and and how it can cut both ways. I mean, you want kids to work hard. You want them to be ambitious. You don't right. want to take away. You don't want to take away that. You know, you don't want to discourage people from from working hard and applying themselves. But you also want black children to play. Yeah. You want them to be able to play and to enjoy their lives and you know, and not to feel like they have to just work all the time. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and so striking that balance. So we need to understand more about the childhood roots of, mm -hmm. of this phenomenon. Um, we need more longitudinal studies. We don't have nearly enough longitudinal studies. We need studies that, um, that will also look at, you know, test the hypothesis vis-a-vis -vis some of, you know, some harder clinical outcomes. You know, uh, the Brody group uh, there at UGA has looked at metabolic syndrome, you know, and found support for the for the hypothesis looking at metabolic syndrome. That's that's important. Um, there's one really important study conducted among Finnish men, we published um, about four years ago, that looked at uh, heart attacks, fatal and non-fatal heart attacks, testing the John Henderson hypothesis precisely in the way uh, 
that I, I constructed, you know, the hypothesis, the interaction between S social economic um, variables and giant Hinduism, found very strong support for future heart attacks among, among Finnish men, European men who were initially free of heart disease. Yeah. So we don't have any studies in the United States and none in African Americans that sort of look at that. So we need some longitudinal studies that look at some of these harder clinical outcomes like heart attacks and stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I'd love to see more studies on gender, uh, even though it looks like black men and black women, for example, score identi identically. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about, you know, areas in which, you know, uh, that phenomenon sort of looks the same in, in black men and black women and, and areas where it, it diverges. Mm -hmm. And um, so we need, we need more work on gender differences. Well, thank you, Dr. James. We have a few questions uh, that were actually submitted from the audience um, that we'd like to get to. So one question that we have is, how do you think the strength aspect of John Henryism is similar to that of the strong black woman schema? Oh, well, well, I guess the very last thing that I said <laughs> connects with that question about, um, about yeah. gender differences. Um, well, well, let me make one point uh, in terms of what distinguishes John Henryism from the uh, superwoman schema or the strong woman schema or the strong black woman schema. One very important distinguishing factor is that, and I've made this point several times, I don't see John Hinduism as specific to any one group of people. I think that when one tests the hypothesis, one needs to be thoughtful about the social, economic, and cultural circumstances that define that group, the history of that group of people, right? Um, and so this has to do with, you know, specifying your theoretical model and your analytical model in an appropriate way. Don't just assume that the way that, you know, it was originally constructed and operationalized and the model was specified to look at it for black men. Don't just assume that the same variables are going to work the same way when you're looking at women or when you're looking at Europeans or when you're looking at Latinos, think carefully about the, how you want to specify the model to take into account other conditions, other variables, right? Mm -hmm. That speak to the life experiences, the lived experiences of that particular group. You don't have to change the questions, the John Henderson, John Henderson questions. They just have to do with a predisposition to engage in higher for coping with adversity. But you have to think about what that adversity looks like, you know, for that particular group, right? So. A better theoretical specification. Now, the fact that black men and black women tend to score identically on John Hinduism, I have never seen a study where that was not the case. Mm -hmm. I have never seen a study where black men score higher than black women on John Hinduism. If it exists, I haven't seen it. So that leads me, and, and since the, the the super the strong the strong black woman schema, if that's the right characterization of it. Uh, and I had the opportunity to actually read a paper uh, that was published by the by the developers of this um, a while back. And, um, and, and so a central element of the strong black woman schema, you know, is this in terms of the, the strength dimension of it, is feeling an obligation to present an image of strength, even when one didn't feel strong. Mm -hmm. feeling, an feeling an obligation to present an image of strength even when one didn't feel strong. Well, black men, for example, might feel an obligation to present an image of strength. They're not going to tell you, even when I don't feel strong, <laughs> even when I don't feel strong. <laughs> They're not going to add that. You know, that might be something that distinguishes the way that you know, that a male might respond, you know, than, than a female. But, um, but that's sort of one way of, of sort of, you know, thinking about the overlap, feeling an obligation, you know, to be strong, right, to be strong, to be resilient, to persist, to not give up, uh, to push forward in order, you know, against constraints, against systemic constraints in order to be successful 
in life. That too is another way of of understanding, you know, what the strong the strong uh, black woman scheme is all about. It's like, you know, not giving up, pushing hard to be successful against these systemic constraints. That's exactly what John Hinduism uh, is. But I think, to, just to conclude, I think that the that the uh, strong strong black woman scheme is. I think it represents a theoretical advance. Uh, <clears throat> because it's going to help better specify that model of risk that I talked about before, right? It's mm -hmm. going to take this notion of determine high effort coping, and it's going to run it through the prism of the black woman experience. It's going to specify that predictive model in a way <clears throat> that does a better job of predicting cardiovascular disease risk for black women then would be the case if you just had John Henryism, right? And if you had the, if you were working with the same variables that we used to develop the theoretical and analytical model on black men. So I think it's an important uh, contribution. There's this core area of overlap, you know, there's the, the determination to be successful against systemic constraints, but at the same time, you know, there are things that need need to be added in order to make that model more more specific and more precise. Thank you. Thank you. Just one more question. Uh, we have just about two minutes left before we have to close. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I was able to ask this participant's question. Would you speak about any relationship between John Henryism and psychological outcomes like distress or mood outcomes? And if the results aren't parallel, um, why do you think that might be? Well, I, I think that the literature that has emerged on John Henryism is very, very clear. High scores on John Henryism uh, tend to correlate with very good psychological health. Um, a, a low probability of, of, of uh, substance abuse, um, a much lower risk for reporting uh, depression symptoms. Um, high scores on John Hinduism typically uh, correlate with um, uh, excellent health, uh, saying, that, saying that one is in excellent health, so people feel good Physically, um, as we all know, you know, one can have high blood pressure and there not be any symptoms. One can have diabetes and there not be any symptoms. Um, but uh, but the literature is really very clear, coming from my own studies, coming from uh, work uh, done by uh, by the Brody Group there at UGA, uh, national studies, studies done in other settings. Um, high scores on John Hinduism connote. Uh, very favorable psychological health, optimism, conscientiousness, energy, work ethic, you know, dependability, high sense of personal responsibility, all of those good things. And it's very, and these, these things, this way of being in the world is a very widespread phenomenon among black Americans. And that is something that people do not appreciate as much as they should. Well, thank you so much. We are about out of time. So thank you, Dr. James, for your time today, helping us to understand your work and its value for us today. I hope this discussion has been helpful and informative to those who are watching. For more about this work and other research, please visit the website for the Center for Family Research. Thanks and have a great day.